grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. Peace to your house and all who live in it. Good morning. Uh, welcome to our Sunday morning worship together here at St. John the Evangelist, North Homewood. My name is Peter. I'm the vicar here. And uh, throughout the course of the service, you'll see Jane and Caroline, two of the other priests in the parish, and the Baileys will also be leading us in some musical worship as well. Um, a few items of news and notices. Um, we're continuing to highlight safeguarding here as a, as a community, as a church. Uh, so a, a link has been shared about our different WhatsApp groups. It's not something we'll really put on our social media necessarily, um, but uh, kind of our more internal communications in order for you to be able to take uh, the safeguarding training that is provided through the Diocese of Guilford. Really encourage you to take that, even if you think, ah, do I really need to? Just, just do it. It'd be great for all of us to be able to be kind of on the same page of what safeguarding means for us as a parish, us as a church community. Because safeguarding isn't just about children or vulnerable adults, it's actually about all of us. So do please uh, take the time to uh, take those trainings. After you get the certificate, if you'll just email that, a copy of that to me so we can have that on record, that would be absolutely fantastic. Um, today, later on at 3 p.m., we have a kids' Zoom session. What is Lent? Lent is coming up. Ash Wednesday is 17th of February, which begins our uh, period of Lent, those 40-some days leading up to Easter, during which we typically give something up. We fast for Lent. Uh, we might give up chocolate or caffeine or alcohol or something like that. Who knows what it might happen to be for you, but we give something up in order to sort of help focus our hearts and our minds on our life of discipleship and to focus our hearts and minds on Jesus, who, whom it is that we follow and whom it is that we are discipled to. So, um, but what does that mean for kids? Goodness gracious, what is Lent all about? And how can you maybe explain that to kids uh, if you'd like to participate in that, email me, vicar at stjnh.org.uk, or uh, DM us on social media, and we'll make sure you get a Zoom code so that you can join in on that at 3 p.m. Uh, today, also, we continue in our series, End of Days, and this morning, we'll be talking about dun, 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 the Antichrist. Last week, we talked about the mark of the beast. This week, we're going to talk a bit about the Antichrist. Who is this person? Mm, what should we expect? How can we kind of be on guard, and how can we know and be prepared? We'll talk about that a little bit later this morning. But for now, let's just take a moment of quiet. And then we're going to pray our prayer of preparation and step into our worship proper. And we pray together, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. And we continue to affirm our Christian faith together with this responsive creed. And so I ask, do you believe and trust in God the Father? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And do you believe and trust in his Son, Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. And do you believe and trust in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, give us a deep insight into your ways and the ways of the world, that seeing with a clear vision, 
and having the spirit of discernment, we may be able to stand firm for justice and speak out in truth through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you, O Father, and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, give to us and your whole church the spirit of wisdom and godly guidance, that we may discern the times in which we live, that we may proclaim with relevance the gospel in all the world. By your spirit, empower all who preach to speak clearly and with vision. We pray for all ministers of the word and of the sacraments. Holy One, hear us. O God, deliver us. We pray for all leaders, that they may have vision and not neglect the responsibilities put on them. We pray for all who plan for our future, for scientists, geneticists, research workers and inventors. For those who influence our minds through broadcasting or the press. We remember all who have lost vision and those who lead others astray. Holy One, hear us. O oh God, deliver us. We give you thanks for those who have revealed your presence and love to us, for those who guided us into the ways of truth. We pray for those who now influence the minds of our young people, for schools, colleges and universities, for young people who have left home or who are forced to spend more time at home due to the pandemic. Holy One, hear us. O oh God, deliver us. We remember all who are handicapped, the physically infirm, the mentally disturbed. We pray for all who have difficulties in communicating with others, for those who have lost the power of speech. We remember those whose minds have been disturbed through violence or drugs all who have been involved with the occult or caught up with evil. Holy One, hear us. O oh God, deliver us. We give thanks for your redeeming love and liberating power, that you free us from all the powers of evil, sin and death, and open up for us the glory of your kingdom. We pray for all who have died in faith and are now at peace. May we rejoice with them in your heavenly kingdom. Holy One, hear us. O oh God, deliver us. Amen. And our colleague for today. God, our Creator, who in the beginning commanded the light to shine out of darkness, we pray that the light of the glorious gospel of Christ may dispel the darkness of ignorance and unbelief. Shine into the hearts of all your people and reveal the knowledge of your glory in the face of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The reading is from 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 to 28. Children, it is the last hour. As you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. From this we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But by going out, they made it plain that none of them belongs to us but you have been anointed by the Holy One, and all of you have knowledge. I write to you, not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and you know that no lie comes from the truth. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Everyone who confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. 
If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is what he has promised us, eternal life. I write these things to you concerning those who would deceive you. As for you, the anointing that you received from him abides in you, and so you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he is revealed, we may have confidence and not be put to shame before him at his coming. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So uh, this morning we're talking about the Antichrist. And that conjures up, again, a lot of sort of imaginations for us. Because you know, for 2,000 years, this has been a part of our consciousness. And particularly as Europeans or people of European descent or European cultural um, influence, uh, this notion of an Antichrist is, is long a part of our uh, cultural history. And it's a bit kind of tricky, isn't it? Because when we think of the Antichrist, we tend to think of somebody or something that is sort of obviously pure evil, right? And it kind of harkens back to what we talked about last week with the mark of the beast, the 666 kind of plastered on someone's forehead. And just that like, it would be really obvious. It would be really like plain that someone is lurking about with just evil dripping off of them in some sort of swarthy way, you know? Um, and, and actually the Antichrist maybe is a little bit more subtle. Maybe is a little bit more subtle than that. So what we read here is from John's first epistle. John's first epistle is written by the same John that wrote his gospel, which in my view also is the same John who wrote the book of Revelation, right? And so in last week, we looked at the book of Revelation, and we talked about the mark of the beast, and its number is 666, and that happens to also be the number of the name of an emperor, a Roman emperor called Nero, Nero Caesar, Nero Caesar. Now, what's kind of interesting, or what's perhaps a little bit peculiar, is though Nero Caesar is an antichrist in a certain sense, and he's kind of one of these characters that sort of just oozes with palpable evil, right? Um, John's first epistle, or no, sorry, yeah, sorry, first epistle, not his gospel, his first epistle was written probably after Nero had already lived and died probably quite a bit later um, in the first century was first John written. And he seems to say here in verse 18, this is the last hour. And as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. So there's a sense wherein Emperor Nero might be sort of representative of the Antichrist. But still yet, there's an anticipation of someone or something who is, in fact, the Antichrist, as it were. Right? So while Emperor Nero might be a type of Antichrist, through whom or by which we might understand what Antichrist is like, he isn't yet the Antichrist. And then John goes on yet further, which is kind of really interesting. He says not only is the Antichrist coming, but later on in the second half of verse 18, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know that it is the last hour. Many antichrists have come. And that's one of the reasons we can sit back and say, well, someone like Nero is a type of an antichrist. Some of these people who are just sort of dripping or oozing with evil and are, are actively and obviously hostile to Jesus and Jesus' followers. Right. And so there's a sense wherein there have always been and there always will be antichrists in that way. And we can kind of seemingly point them out. Um, and, and in some sense, we have this expectation that the antichrist, yet again, is going to be in that same sort of a mold. Someone who has some kind of 
absolute political power through which there will be the ability to mistreat, persecute, um, imprison, or put to death people who follow Jesus, right? And the scripture certainly seems to allude that that might be the case, that that is something that we might be able to expect. But here's what I think is, is quite interesting. Verse 19 carries on. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. When John is talking about many antichrists, he then further elaborates and say, these are people who have gone out from us. These are people who would have been, at some level, a part of the church. At some level, associate to perhaps even the apostles. But have gone out from us. And it makes us think, perhaps even all the way back, um, all, all the way back, makes us think of last week, the beast out of the sea in Revelation chapter 13, who had two horns that looked like the lamb, but it spoke like the dragon. And the lamb being an illusion or being a representation or drawing our attention to who Jesus is and the dragon drawing our attention to who Satan is. Actually, there's something about antichrists or the antichrist that actually looks a lot like Jesus, but speaks a lot like the adversary. And the reality is, is that when we're thinking about antichrists or the antichrist, we probably need to be less worried about or less concerned about someone like Nero, who just sort of oozes and drips pure evil, evil like the fruits of the devil, you know, like less sort of concerned about that as we need to be on the lookout for that which looks a bit like Jesus. At first blush, you go, that's, that's like Jesus, that's Christian. But upon further examination, sounds a lot more like the adversary. That's where it's tricky, isn't it? That's where it's tricky. People aren't really deceived by someone who drips and oozes pure evil. We're deceived by something that's, that's quite confusing and a bit vexing because you go, ooh, they seem like a nice person. Well, they talk about love and grace and mercy, and they talk about forgiveness, and they talk about good things, and they talk about blessing, and they talk about my good, and they talk about all these kinds of things that, that I go, I go, yeah, 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 that's right, that's right. I'm, I'm on board. But when you scratch it back just a little bit, it's not love, grace, mercy, forgiveness, or good as Jesus has revealed it to us. That's tricky. That's tricky. Let's carry on here, verse 19. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. I don't write to you because you don't know the truth, but because you do know, the, know it. And because no lie comes from the truth. Who is the liar? It is whoever denies Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist. Denying Jesus is the Christ. There are a troubling number of people within the church and within the Church of England who deny Jesus is the Christ. 
I mean, they'll say he's the Christ in, in sort of a, a, a kind of a generic way. Like, yeah, he was anointed, because he, he, Christ is just the English translation of the Greek word Christos, which is a translation of the Hebrew word Messiah or Mashiach, which just means anointed one, right? And typically uh, anointed to be like king or anointed to be high priest or, or something of that order. And so we recognize Jesus as the rightful king, as the one true high priest, and so we might kind of just kind of in a surfacey way go, yeah, yeah, Jesus was special. And, and most everybody, Christian or not, will say, no, Jesus of Nazareth, he was special. Now, they might say he was just a misunderstood rabbi. They might say he was a charismatic speaker. He might say, uh, they, they might say that he was a, a miracle worker. They might say he was indeed a prophet. They might say he was a political revolutionary. They might say he was an enlightened one. They might say he was like a Buddha. They might say all kinds of different things. But actually, what does the Bible say about what it means that Jesus is the Christ? That's what's important. What have the apostles taught us about what it means that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the Messiah, that he is the anointed one, that there is something cosmic about his identity, and there's something cosmic about his activity. There's something redemptive, healing, and restorative of all things in his person. That's what the apostles teach us. And this is why John is saying, listen, people have gone out from us, but they didn't belong to us because they've gone out from us and they haven't held on to this apostolic teaching about what it means that Jesus is the Christ. So John, the same John that wrote this epistle, wrote his gospel. And if some of you have like hated yourself enough to join Thursday night Bible study, you know, um, we're, we're almost a year into it. We're almost done with it. And after that, we're going to actually do Revelation. Uh, but when we first started, John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, is how we typically translate the, that Greek sentence, the opening line of John's gospel. And arche and halagos in Greek, in the beginning was the Word. Now, there's another way that that phraseology, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, Right? There's another way of, of, of kind of understanding that Greek. And I'm not saying one is right or one is wrong. What I'm saying is actually it rounds out our understanding. And this other way of understanding the Greek grammar here was in the beginning is a truth, a reason, a rationale, a logic, a message. And that message that truth, that reasoning was directed towards God and God is the content of that message. In other words, at the very beginning, it's all about God and it's all directed towards God. Everything about everything is about God and in God's direction. It's all towards God. The long arc of history, I've said, bends towards Jesus because Jesus is that reason, that logic, that foundational truth that unlocks the understanding of all other things. That's what it means that Jesus is the Christ. That's what it means that Jesus is the Messiah. It means that all of history was leading up to and pointing to his earthly life and ministry, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, and his sure return. And living on this side of his incarnation, all of history right now is coming off of that truth and is anticipating his return because the long arc of history bending towards Jesus also means that it's bending towards restoration, recreation, wholeness, and healing where there is no more death or mourning or crying or pain. See, the truth of who Jesus is insinuates, it indicates, it reveals that this world we live in is broken. And we know that all too well. It's broken by war. It's broken by poverty. It's broken by disease. It's broken by all kinds of different stuff. And it's broken within me. My selfishness, my greed, my apathy my anger. 
my self-absorption. And whatever it is that's broken in the world is broken right through my heart. And it's worked out in the world that God has given humanity to steward on his behalf. Jesus reveals that. He reveals that in his death and his fracturing. Though none of his bones were broken, his body was broken and his blood was shed, revealing that this material creation, though being good, is broken. And in him, just like his body is raised from the dead, in him all of creation will be raised. This is what's going on in history. And you can tell me, well, the science doesn't tell us this. Fine, science is not my God. I believe in science. Yeah, great. I think the scientific method is fantastic. We've come to learn more than we ever imagined we could know or understand using the scientific method. But it's just a way of knowing science is not God and scientists are not priests or prophets. Like, and this is the thing I'm, 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 I want to tell us. And this is the thing I want us to grab a hold on. Who's telling you what about Jesus? If Jesus, to you and to me, is not the revelation of God himself and the revelation of creation history. If he is not the savior and redeemer of all things, then I have embraced and you've embraced the teaching of an antichrist. And that feels like really heavy, like, whoa! Of course. Of course, because the world we live in, the situation we live and move and have our being in is antichrist. Everything's fine. I mean, no, it's not, but we can fix it. I mean, things are, it's, the world is beautiful and it's good and yeah, it's got some brokenness in it, but we can fix it if we just get the right education, if we just get the right economic policies, if we just get the right political structures, if we just get the right things in place, we can work together and we can take concepts of love and we can take concepts of grace, we can take concepts of mercy, we can kind of mold them however it is we understand them and use them to put together structures that can fix this world and I just want to say we've been doing that for millennia and it has not worked we've taken the love of Jesus revealed in his death and his resurrection and we've set that aside in exchange for love that looks like us We've taken grace and mercy that is revealed in Jesus' body broken and blood shed, his resurrection. We've exchanged that for a grace and a mercy that looks really shallow and says, no, you've not done anything wrong. It's fine. That's not grace and mercy. That's just sappy drivel, really. Sorry, I don't mean to be rude. But it kind of is. There is no grace where there's been no offense. There's no mercy where there's been no offense. There's no forgiveness where there's been no offense. We have obliterated grace, mercy, and forgiveness from most of our society because we've obliterated the idea of offense, unless, of course, you're driving a dirty diesel. Or you're participating in racial injustice. Or you're part of some sort of systemic human trafficking. Those things are wrong. Don't misunderstand. Like, yeah, fine. Totally agree. But that's also a really easy way for a lot of us to put sin over there.
instead of acknowledge it right here. And that's an easy way to say, they're bad. Whew, I'm good. Good job. I don't need grace and mercy and forgiveness. But then vexingly, we know we do too, isn't it? Aren't we messed up? We're so confused in ourselves. It's like we see the stuff in here and we don't know how to deal with it. There's so much guilt and there's so much shame. And so we either ignore it, tamp it down, or we justify it. We say, oh, it's not that bad, or oh, it's okay, or I only feel that way because of you, you jerkhead face wad, you know, or whatever else. Or we say, well, at least I'm not like them over there. And we compare ourselves to worse people than us. And Jesus, as the Christ says, you're not okay. And I love you. And I don't love you in a way that says, you're not okay, and that's okay. It's, you're not okay. I love you. Let's walk together towards healing and health and wholeness. And I promise you, Jesus says, the good work I'm beginning in you, I will carry it on to completion. You will be raised from the dead just like I was. And when that happens, the job will be done. Remain in me. That's what John is saying here, isn't he? He carries on. As for you, verse 24, see that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you, that Jesus is the Christ, that we have sinned and he loves us. And there's grace and mercy and forgiveness understood through his life, death, and resurrection. If it does, you also remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is what he promised us, eternal life. Bodily resurrection, but not just bodily resurrection in the future, because the same John who wrote this letter told us in his gospel that eternal life begins now as we enter into relationship with God. Through faith in Jesus. Verse 26, I'm writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. As for you, the anointing you received from him remains in you. And you don't need anyone to teach you, but as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it is taught, remain in him. And now, dear children, continue in him, so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before his coming. Here's the deal. Whatever we know to be true is rooted in Jesus. Whatever it is we believe to be true about Jesus needs to be informed by his apostles and his close associates, the people who saw him, who walked with him who learned from him, who saw him die, saw him bodily alive again, saw him ascend to heaven, were witnesses to his truth. Let us not have the kind of chronological snobbery that thinks because we live 2,000 years after the fact, we're somehow smarter than the people who saw him. Let's hold fast to Jesus Christ. And all of the uncomfortable things that that means. I sin. I need forgiveness. I need to just be humble and accept it. Jesus is the Christ. He's King of kings and Lord of lords. I need to be on his side. 
and I need my thoughts about what is right and what is wrong and what is true to be informed by him and his apostles and his close associates. Not by whatever is in vogue, whatever is trendy, and whatever the culture around me is pressing upon me to believe. We can't focus on all the things that are anti-Christ. We need to focus on Christ. And in remaining in him, we're prepared for whatever may come. Whether they're little antichrists that we see on TV or in music or in news or in our neighborhood, in our home, or whether it's some big dun 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 anti Christ, we'll be ready. We'll be ready. And that's what we're going to do now in communion. Is we're going to say, Jesus Christ, crucified, risen again, ascended and returning. We take you in. We take your truth in. And we remain in you. Amen. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. Scorned by the ones he came to save Till on that cross as Jesus died The wrath of God was satisfied For every sin on him was laid Here in the death of Christ Commands my death.
as we uh, prepare to come to the Lord's table, uh, we always spend time of confession. And maybe this is a time for us to sort of reflect a bit on who the Antichrists or what the Antichrists in our own lives might be. Where is it that somewhere along the line I, I've denied Jesus' lordship? I've somehow or another sort of set who Jesus is aside. And maybe, you know, as I alluded to in the service or in the sermon, maybe you've sort of privileged the priesthood or prof prophetic place or the almost apostolic role of academics and scientists and, and, and that sort of thing who happen to also reject the notion or any truth that might suggest Jesus' lordship. And you've, you've privileged that. Perhaps you've privileged something political, whether it's your party or certain policies, and you've sort of forgotten that Jesus is the, is the redeemer, restorer, healer, recreator of all things. Maybe, maybe what's antichrist in you is that you've sort of grabbed on to a sort of a, a sappy, shallow view of love, grace, mercy, and forgiveness that isn't as full of truth as it is full of grace. It's not a love like in John's epistle that is understood by Jesus' crucifixion, death, and resurrection. Maybe your notion of love isn't informed by the self-sacrifice that Jesus reveals it to, make, to be, to involve. Maybe that which is antichrist in you is, is just not being willing to acknowledge some things that are wrong within you that need to be named and addressed as uncomfortable as it might be. Maybe what's antichrist in you is thinking that you are beyond forgiveness. Who you are, what you've done, is just too vile. Or it's too persistently disobedient to Jesus. That who you are and what you've done is somehow or another beyond, is, is somehow more infinite and more eternal than God himself. And what's antichrist in you is that you think you're beyond redemption or there is no hope. Whatever it is for you, as we confess, let's put everything that's antichrist aside. Let's just let's chuck it. And let's embrace in a radical way that Jesus of Nazareth is God. In him, the truth about myself, the truth about you, the truth about us, the truth about all of creation is understood. Because it's all about God. And it's all towards God. And the long arc of history bends towards Jesus. And so let's embrace his truth. Let's embrace his forgiveness, his grace, his mercy, his healing, his restoration of all things. And let's together be a people of hope that knowing, that, that, that know he will return. And when he does, Everything will be made right. So let's take a moment to be on the right side of Jesus now. God so loved the world 
that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. So let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. We confess together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Having peace with God, we have peace with each other. The peace of the Lord be always with you and also with you. Let us offer one another a sign of God's peace, either on your WhatsApp group, here on Facebook, or in your households, or all of the above. Let's do that as I prepare the table. Before we come to our Eucharistic prayer, I know we've already done confession, and this is liturgically anachronistic. I apologize. But since when have I been one to fuss about that too much? Um, it could be that what is anti-Christ in you or in me is an unwillingness or inability to extend to others what we have received from God. And that is a fullness of grace and truth. And perhaps in some of our relationships, they aren't full of truth and so they're not full of grace either. And so what we've experienced from God isn't making its way out into the world in a way that reveals what recreation will be like. Does that make sense? And perhaps what's antichrist in me or in us or perhaps in you, I don't know who exactly this is for. Maybe it's for me, I don't know. Is that there's like, it's like there's a cork, right? And everything about me and God is just me and God. And it's not shared out. And in Christ, God has revealed and is doing. He is sharing it out by his spirit in the world because of Christ's death, resurrection, and ascension. It's to be shared out. Maybe that's for you. Maybe that's for me. Maybe that's for no one. Maybe somebody's going to watch this in three weeks' time and needs to hear that. I don't know. But let's carry on with our Eucharistic prayer. The Lord is here. 
His Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is indeed right. It is our duty and our joy at all times and in all places to give you thanks and praise, Holy Father, Heavenly King, Almighty and Eternal God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, for he is our great high priest who has freed us from our sins and has made us to be a royal priesthood to you, our God and Father. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. In the same night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This cup is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. As we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory, send your Holy Spirit that this bread and this wine may be to us the body and blood of your dear Son. As our Savior taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body because we all share in one bread. Draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you. And feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. the body of Christ broken for us. The cup of the new covenant in Christ's blood shed for us. And now our post-communion prayers. Almighty God, whose Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, is the light of the world, may your people, illumined by your word and sacrament, shine with the radiance of his glory. By the power of your Spirit, sustain us in our isolation, that we may live in peace, free from anxiety, to your praise and glory. Amen. And we pray together, Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, we offer you, our souls and bodies, to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit 
to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning or whenever it is you happen to be uh, viewing this. Hopefully you haven't just viewed it, but you've engaged. You've really engaged. Um, for those of you with, with children who would like to join us at 3 p.m., do please uh, contact me so that I can get you uh, the Zoom code for uh, what is Lent for our kids uh, this afternoon at 3 o'clock. And now the blessing. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Guard your hearts and minds and the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you now and always. Amen.